Hi, my name is Valerie, and today I'll be giving a presentation over a use case example on how you could use a LiDAR bathymetric spectrometer to look at areas of interest and make sure that you're revisiting the areas of interest at least every day. Now we're going to take a break from the presentation and discuss what is LiDAR. So LiDAR stands for the Light Detection and Ranging System. It uses a remote sensing with a pulse laser which is able to measure range and distance. These pulses create three-dimensional views which show the surface characteristics on Earth. Bathymetric LiDAR, in particular, is able to penetrate through water using a specialized green wavelength. A drawback of using bathymetric LiDAR is that it's mainly captured during night, and it can be skewed and affected by the atmosphere, such as clouds and air traffic. Another drawback is that LiDAR is captured with a last terrain file, and this can often be difficult in what is used for post-processing. So the problem that's being faced around the world today is that sea levels along coastal regions are rising at increasingly faster rates each year. And in fact, about 40% of the population lives along these highly dense areas of the coast. And 8 out of 10 of the largest cities are along these coastal regions. 17% or 1 in 6 of the nation's threatened and endangered species are at risk from rising sea levels. Ecosystems and infrastructure can also be damaged, displaced, or destroyed due to rising sea levels. In the top right-hand picture, we can see a picture of China, which is being threatened due to a natural disaster. In the middle picture, we have Sunderbonds, which houses the world's largest population of critically endangered tigers. It also houses one of the world's largest mango groves. And in this, we can see that both are being threatened due to rising sea levels. In our bottom picture, we, here we can see we have Greenland. This is 42.3 square miles of ice. This ice chunk broke off in the Arctic and is the largest ice of chunk to break off in the Arctic. So for today, we're going to design a minimal constellation of CubeSats that will be able to image these pre-chosen critical coastal locations and show that the ocean levels are rising using a LiDAR bathymetric spectrometer system. The three constraints that we will have imposed is that we must image all 12 of our critical regions and be able to revisit these regions at least every day. We will also need to minimize the cost of our CubeSats, which we can do based upon our constellation design. And lastly, each CubeSat will only be able to house one LiDAR bathymetric spectrometer system for visualization purposes. And this is due to the size of the CubeSat as well as spectrometer. We will then have three requirements that we will come back to throughout the duration of this presentation. First, all 12 critical regions need to be visualized and revisited at least every day. Secondly, we need to minimize the cost of the CubeSat constellation design. And our third requirement is that we need to analyze the worst case conditions. This will allow us to analyze at every phase of the mission life cycle. This is inclusive of cloud coverage, atmospheric absorption, and the fact that the imagery may only be taken at night. Here again, you can see our three requirements as they are laid out with Cameo. In our first requirement, we can see that the constellation must visit each of our 12 critical regions and revisit at least every day. Secondly, the cost of our CubeSat constellation design must be minimized. And lastly, we can only have one spectrometer per CubeSat. We will do this by using open data-driven models such as spectrometers and a bathymetric LiDAR spectrometer system. We will directly feed this into SDK's multi-domain mission simulations and toolkit. Alongside this, we will use external integration and orchestration with Model Center, Cameo, and Excel. We'll use data management alongside to make the best sense of our trade studies. We will look at all of the different outputs that we can and analyze the best data from this. This will allow us to find our critical issues faster. A downside of using LiDAR is that the only output is a LAS file, and this can often be limiting in which software you can use for analysis. SDK can use a LAS file indirectly and directly. Here we can see in the top left-hand corner a color-coded elevation imagery. This file can be natively read inside of SDK, and this works well with LiDAR because it's able to show the distances in different colors. In the bottom left-hand photo, here we can see color-coded elevation imagery. Inside of SDK, there are many natively read files, but this can be converted to be used directly inside of SDK. To the right, we have all the different file types that SDK can natively read and use as terrain. Now we'll begin with our SDK demo. Before we begin, we can talk about our layout and setup. In the middle of our screen, we have our integrated workspace. This shows our 3D and 2D graphics. To the left, we have our object browser. This is where all of our objects live. And we will see how we can set up some of our objects and add constraints. 
In the bottom left, we have our globe manager. This is how we can show how we can easily import different terrain or color-coded elevation imagery for use inside of SDK, and we can show how quickly this is done for last files. And at the top of our screen, we have some of our native properties, such as starting, stopping, and replaying the scenario. We'll start there. First, we'll start through the scenario and see how this affects in our 2D and 3D graphics. We'll restart the scenario and see how quickly we can add in our color-coded elevation imagery from our actual last file that we have. And we can also see some of the natively inherent terrain that we have inside when we download SDK. You can see that the color-coded elevation imagery is directly relayed over on top of our globe. Next, we're going to add some of our constraints, which show that our ground targets can only be seen during nighttime. So we're going to use our sunlight intervals and import that we only have our lighting intervals for umbra and penumbra. We're only going to do this for Amsterdam, as the rest of our area targets have already been set up for us. Next, we're going to set up our sensor. First, we're going to rename it EOIR, or LIDAR. And we are going to set this up using EOIR Electrical Optical Infrared. We're going to navigate to a time when we know that our EOIR sensor is able to see our Ascension Island. This is one of our targets that we will be looking at. We'll now talk about the EOIR properties that we are able to set up and show within SDK. We'll use EOIR to model our LiDAR capabilities. We'll decrease our horizontal and vertical half angle to represent our laser beam width. We will also reduce our related detector parameters for horizontal and vertical pixel pitch, as this will natively represent our LiDAR system. On the spectral tab, we're also going to use our limited green white wavelength so that we can penetrate through the water and see these distances. On our pointing, we can see that we are looking at our areas of interest. Now we can look back at Ascension Island and see our finite wavelength. We're going to move over our target and use this for analysis. We're going to set up our first scene. This spectral scene will show us what we would see with LiDAR, and we'll want to look at the properties to see what we would be seeing. We're looking at our first cloud set because we want to look at our worst case scenario. As we've set up our spectral scene, we can now look at the details. We'll want to pay close attention to our spectral irradiance and in-band irradiance. The closer we get to zero, we know that means that it would be the harder it'd be able to see with our LiDAR system. So if it's close to zero, it means we may not be able to see it at all. And we have identified a critical issue. We can now compare this to when we don't have any clouds or atmospheric absorption, which would be our best case scenario, and see how they differ. Now if we look at the details in a similar spot within our spectral scene, we can see that our spectral irradiance and in-band irradiance are about four times larger and be much more likely to be able to see. Now we're going to start inserting our coverage definition. Our coverage definition will allow us to place points on the grids to see if we have access or if we were able to see these points. We will assign our areas of interest to our coverage definition as we will only look at our areas of interest from our CubeSat and LiDAR spectrometer system. We'll also add a figure of merit to make sure that we've met the question, are we able to revisit our areas of interest? And are we able to revisit our areas of interest at least every day? Here you can see we can simply choose all of our areas of interest. We're also going to reduce the point granularity within our areas of interest so that we are making sure that we're looking at a tight definition within our areas of interest. We're going to make a constellation of our LiDAR spectrometer system. And right now, we only have one LiDAR spectrometer. But if we go later in this problem, we may add more. And we want them to be our assets so we can look at our areas of interest on our coverage definition. Here we can see that the areas of orange is when we have access or when we are able to see our areas of interest, where the areas which are white are when we are not able to see our areas of interest. On our figure of merit, we're now changing this to be a revisit time of less than one day. This will show us if our requirement is met that we are able to see our areas of interest at least every day. 
We have disabled our animated graphics and have turned on our static graphics, as this would be more closely what we would want to represent with our LiDAR spectrometer system. We're now going to compute axes for our coverage definition and see what we would see with this scenario. Here we can see that Greenland is orange, which we have set to say that we may not be able to meet our objective. And we can look at this with more fidelity by using the Report and Graph Manager. Within this Report and Graph Manager, we'll choose two different report types and we'll look to see if we've met our requirements or if we need to revisit our parameters and change them so that we have met our requirements of our revisit time and are we able to see all of our areas of interest. Here we can see that we have a max revisit time of 30 days, so we are not meeting our objective of at least one day. And as we go statistics by region, we can see that Greenland is the reason that we're not meeting our maximum revisit time and have a max revisit time of 30 days. And in some areas of interest, we're not seeing them at all. So now we're going to add a Walker constellation. A Walker constellation will let us, let us add more satellites and LiDAR spectrometer systems so that we will be able to look at our areas of interest and see if we add more, it will be able to meet our requirements. We will later introduce cost analysis with this so we're not over-designing our problem. Now we can see all of the regions of orange, which means that we have more accesses to our areas of interest. Again, we will look at these reports to see if we have, are able to meet our objective. As we look at this grid stat report, we can see that we have a max revisit time of 0.125 days. So we have over met our objective and we are able to see all of our areas of interest. Here again, we can see our requirements with Cameo and we can see now that our first and third requirement is met. Our constellation is able to visit each of our areas of interest and be able to revisit at least every day. And our spectrometer, we only have one spectrometer per CubeSat. Next, we will talk about cost and our cost analysis. Here we can see our Excel spreadsheet, which was used for our cost analysis. This uses simple equations, so that which have a somewhat linear relationship. So as you add more CubeSats and you add more spectrometers, the relationship of cost will increase. Here we have Model Center, which we've integrated with SDK, and we'll run our first analysis of costs. We'll use the Walker parameters so that we can increase our CubeSats, and we can increase our LiDAR bathymetric spectrometers, and we can do an output scenario analysis to see if we increase this, how our cost will change, and we will try to meet our cost requirements, as well as meeting our objective that we're still revisiting and seeing all of our areas of interest at least every day. We're moving over our number of planes and number of CubeSats per plane, and we're seeing how our output will be affected, which is total cost, as well as our objective, which still needs to be met. Here we can see that all of the runs are being calculated and tabulated inside of Model Center. We can now look at this in a different view to see if our objectives have been met and how we can make sure that we're choosing the best result. We can see that with five satellite, five CubeSats, and five planes, our total cost is around 1,600, whereas if we have one CubeSat and one plane, it's about one-eighth the cost. Here within our scatter plot, we can even eliminate some of our constraints because we know our relationship is linear. We'll try to reduce our CubeSats as well as our planes and we'll highlight a lower cost because we want to implement this. And we'll also make sure that our objective is shown. So only, we'll only show results where we are revisiting all of our areas of interest at least every day. Here we can see our four planes being shown with different colors and how the cost is increasing linearly. Here we can show our total cost and we'll go through three of the different examples that we have. So here we can see our least amount of cost is with one CubeSat and four planes for a total cost of 302 million, which just meets our objective. And secondly, if we had three planes and four CubeSats, we've almost tripled our cost, but we've still met our objective, or we could have four planes and two CubeSats for somewhere in the middle.
So here we can see that if we have one CubeSat and four planes, that would be the best requirement for our objective. We are seeing all of our areas of interest at least every day, and we have minimized our cost. And again, we can show that with Cameo. We can show that we have met all three of our objectives now. Our constellation is able to see each of our areas of interest and revisit at least every day. The cost of our LiDAR system and CubeSat constellation has been minimized. And lastly, we only have one spectrometer per CubeSat. And here we can see that our inputs have been evaluated and we've shown that our revisit time has been met. Thank you for watching my presentation. And if you have any questions, we have support available at AGI.com. Thank you.